Welcome and thank you for joining us today to talk about truth and transformation, uprooting racism and reimagining policing in the United States. I'm Allison McKinney Tim, founder and executive director of Justice Revival, a Christian voice for human rights in the US. And I'll be your host for today's conversation. This is the third event in our series, The Heart of Human Rights, Faith-Fueled Advocacy on Issues of Our Day. And it's sponsored by the generosity of Deb and Bruce McLeod of San Francisco. I'd like to invite our participants who are tuning in to introduce yourselves in the chat box and raise your questions through the Q&A function. We'll be addressing them later on in the program. So it has been over a year since Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin killed George Floyd, an unarmed black man in broad daylight. And that of course was a galvanizing moment coming as it did on the heels of so many other visible similar incidents starting perhaps with the 2012 killing of Trayvon Martin that galvanized the Black Lives Matter movement. Calls for reform after Floyd's death have been swift and forceful. And yet over the last year, police force in this country claimed over a thousand more lives. Chauvin was recently convicted of murder, but during his trial even, police encounters claimed an average of three lives per day. The risk of lethal violence we know falls disproportionately on black and brown communities. Black individuals in this country are more than twice as likely as white individuals to be killed by police when they are unarmed. As people of faith and conscience, we can't profess a belief in the sacredness of human life and ignore the ongoing crisis of police violence. So the slow pace of reform has many looking outside our US justice system for answers and for accountability. Many of us seek wisdom and comfort in our faith communities. Others are looking to the global human rights system for principled accountability. Faith on one hand, human rights on the other, each give us ethical frameworks from which we can critique and respond to what's happening in our country. And our conversation today lies at the intersection of both of those ethical systems. So please join me in welcoming our expert panel of guest speakers. Ms. Nicole Austin Hillary is the US Executive Director for the US Program at Human Rights Watch. She leads their response to human rights violations and abusive systems in this country including problems in our criminal justice system, as well as economic inequality. Reverend Terrence M. McKinley is Director of Racial Justice and Mobilizing at Sojourners, the nation's largest Christian messaging and media organization, where he provides leadership to advocacy and mobilization efforts that mobilize people of faith to fight racist systems He's also senior pastor of the historic Campbell AME Church here in Washington, DC. So again, a warm welcome to both of our esteemed guests. And let me start um, by asking you, uh, Reverend Terrence, um, what would you say looking back on the last year have we seen change in response to the calls for reform? What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, let me just say thank you to, uh, to you, Allison, and to uh, Justice Revival for uh, the invitation to be a part of this incredible panel today. And uh, to my colleagues, it's, it's wonderful to be in conversation with you uh, this, this afternoon. Um, you know, one year after the death of George Floyd, um, we do have to ask ourselves the question, how much has really changed? Um, we, we hear the statistics that you have 
lifted, and it um, it it begs it begs that question. I think that um, we can acknowledge that number one, one of the great things that has come out of this moment is that there's been a renewed urgency uh, by persons uh, across communities and across color lines to see justice for black and brown persons who are um, uh, disproportionately targeted by law enforcement. Um, we have seen a movement that has been uh, uh, created, we hope, right? I often talk about this movement as feeling like I have a cautious optimism uh, because it looks like it could lead to transformation and change if it is sustained. Um, but, but we have to continue to pr put pressure in order for uh, real change to occur. Uh, so that's, that's how I view it on the national scale. And the, only, the other thing that I would mention is right here in Washington, DC, we lead a piece of work around our theology and racialized policing program. And we've seen pastors that have been engaged in this work that are uh, leading efforts in their own cities and neighborhoods uh, to address it. And uh, we have these on the ground examples of, of persons that are seeking to bring change in their own way. <clears throat> I wanna ask you even more about that a little later on. Let me welcome Professor Justin Hansford, our third panelist joining us now. He's executive director of the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center at Howard University School of Law. He's a leading scholar and activist in critical race theory, human rights and law and social movements. He's also co-author of the textbook, Race, Racism and American Law. And we're glad to have you uh, joining us, I started with the question, what progress, if any, have we seen over the years since George Floyd's murder? And Nicole, now to you with that, what is your big picture overview? First of all, Allison, uh, let me thank you for, one, hosting this discussion and having this discussion. This is an example of one of the things that I think has resulted from this past year of focus on racial justice is that we are having more conversations. And if you all will recall, uh, during the Obama administration, you all remember when Eric Holder was the Attorney General of the United States. And he, during a speech, said that the United States, that we as, as a United States community, that we were cowards when it came to talking about race. And you all will remember that he was admonished. People were, were saying, how could he say this? But he was right. And one of the things that has emanated from this moment that we're in is that I think we gain more courage as a, as a collective community, that we are having many discussions and really confronting our history and the evils of racism uh, in ways that we never have before in this country. Now, mind you, that is not a solution to the problems and talking by itself is not nearly enough, but it's a beginning point. Um, and I think that is a key change that we've seen. And I frankly don't think it's going anywhere. Um, one, I don't think all of the activists um, and the people who are demanding justice are going to allow these conversations to go into the back rooms and be hidden uh, from public view any longer. That's one of the big changes. Um, I also have to say, Allison, and in full disclosure, I don't know, I know you're super smart, I don't know if you realize you were doing this, but there are these six degrees of separation on this panel. So we have Professor Hansford. I, I'm an alum, proud alumnus of the Howard University School of Law, the only law school in the country. I'm sorry to everybody else. Uh, and for Reverend Terrence, I, I'm a born and bred AME and I attend Brown Memorial AME here in the District of Columbia. So um, you, you somehow put it, wove all of these pieces together, Allison. Um, so I, I just wanted to acknowledge, acknowledge those connections. Um, let me also say that in addition to these, these conversations that we are having, I think we are also seeing that there is pressure coming from the rest of the world. And that is particularly important for me as a, a leader in the human rights community. Um, you know, historically, we have seen leaders in the past, um, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, we've seen leaders that really try to engage the trans-global community. 
in our fight for racial justice in the United States. Um, and it's never been as robust uh, and it's never been as effective as, and as impactful as we have wanted it to be. But we are seeing that the rest of the world is paying attention in ways that it never has before. And part of that is because the rest of the world sees themselves in what's happening and what's been happening in the United States. I can't tell you how many conversations I've been a part of where people have said, yes, because of what happened to George Floyd, because of what happened to Breonna Taylor, um, because of Ahmaud Arbery, we are able to look within our own communities and we have been taking to the streets and we have been having these conversations and demanding more. That's one of the big changes too. And again, I think both of those things coupled together have created a foundation from which we can really build um, that I think has created tremendous momentum. And I don't see us going back from there. So increased mobilization, social demands for change, translocal activism, communities, not just here in this country, but around the world, concerned about police killings such as George Floyd suffered. Uh, Justin Hansford, over to you. Have you seen change in the last year? And I'll add, how much did the conviction of Derek Chauvin matter in the in the call for reform? Well, well, Allison, first, thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm, I'm very honored to be on this panel with such, um, you know, very well, you know, well-informed panelists, and of course, my fellow alum, uh, Howard Bison. I, I think a lot has, a lot has changed. A lot has changed for the better. Some, is, some things have changed for the worst. Uh, at least from my perspective, as someone who wants police reform, in in uh, the state of Maryland, right here, um, where I am right now, and um, also in Virginia and New York, we've seen new uh, use of force policies passed on the state level, increased independent oversight of police agencies. Colorado uh, stripped police officers of a legal protection known as qualified immunity, which protects officers from most civil lawsuits, making it really impossible to create any sort of uh, civil legal incentive for police officers to stay within the bounds of the law. But then at the same time, you have other states and not, not to be honest, Republican controlled states in Oklahoma, Florida, and Texas that have gone in the exact opposite direction. We've seen the passage of so-called anti-rioting bills, which are, to be honest, anti-protest uh, bills targeted at um, making sure that Black Lives Matter protests will be more at risk, uh, arrests are upgraded to felonies. In some of these states, you can even uh, hit uh, people who are blocking the road with your car and they, there's there are protections for that. We've seen uh, this push to ban critical race theory from uh, schools. I know that's something people may have heard about. Well, and I've even- there, If I may, because mm -hmm. I know this is an area of deep expertise for you, Justin. Can you just, for people who aren't familiar, give a quick definition of what critical race theory is and why it's important? Sure, C critical race theory is a, a way of understanding the law that makes visible how uh, race and power and inequality intersect with our legal system. The hope in making that invisible intersection visible for, for people is uh, the hope that we can change those inequalities. I have to say, I've seen articles in the news, I've seen even politicians say things like critical race theory is, is anti-biblical. Critical race theory teaches everyone to be Marxist and, and is, you know, is, is against God. It's, it's been terrible to hear some of the things that have been said about a, a field of research, a field of study that I've studied for about uh, 15, uh, almost close to, uh, 20 years, to be honest. And um, just like any other field of study, you have hundreds of scholars 
in any academic field, you know, I, I don't know how you could ban math or ban soci sociology, but people want to ban critical race theory. And this is it's really a desire to ban the study of racism. And, and we know that the Southern Baptist Convention has um, seen this conversation with many pushing back strongly against critical race theory. Maybe, um, maybe you want to say a, a word on that, and we can ask our other panelists to weigh in too. Sure. Well, you, you know that, you know that that conversation is is, is close to my heart, um, and um, I have a uh, uncle who is a, a pastor in Plano, Texas. And we've had many conversations about this. This this uh, this moment that we're in, many people are calling it a moment of racial reckoning, is a moment where people, if you think about Tulsa, Oklahoma, you're thinking about you know Juneteenth, people are having to look at what has happened in our past for many people for the first time. Unfortunately, many people never heard of Tulsa before this year, and they never heard of Juneteenth. And now it's a federal holiday. The question we should be asking is, why have we never heard of these things? Why were we never taught these things? As opposed to asking, how can we ban schools from teaching about Juneteenth or teaching about Tulsa? How can we make sure that people in the future don't get taught these histories? Because we, we fear that the histories may be uncomfortable or divisive. I, I, to me, it's similar to... Uh, hearing someone say you may have a, um, you know, a heart ailment or some sort of disease and you say, well, don't tell me about it. I don't, you know, don't, <laughs> you know, don't give me a diagnosis. I want to go and run my marathon. Don't tell me about any problem that may be there with my heart. I don't want to know. Surprise, surprise. If you do that, you're going to be in trouble once you get on that racetrack. So I, I think that that's, that's really what's at stake. I think um, that has been a driver for the other bills that have been passed in these states, pushing against Black Lives Matter protests. And of course, we have not even mentioned that the vote, the voter rights uh, situation, but all of these things are being driven by this idea that we don't want to hear from you. We don't want to hear your voice as opposed to having an impulse saying that, okay, we know that some of the things that may come out of this conversation will be hard truths mm -hmm. that will make us feel uncomfortable when we hear them. I'm gonna get a bad diagnosis. I'm gonna learn about a disease. The solution should be find medicine as opposed oh, to avoid hearing about the disease, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and from a just a really straightforward New Testament textual perspective, we have the truth will set you free as a, yeah. a word from the New Testament. Maybe that's a good pivot um, back to Terrence. I know you've thought a lot about what a Christian theology of policing would look like. So I wonder if, if you could weigh in um, on your thoughts of what a Christian theology should include. And maybe that relates to critical race theory. Um, because I imagine the experience of critical race theory has been quite different from the perspective of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Yeah, so it's it's something that is a very, um, ex it's exciting for me. Uh, let me just uh, quickly just point to just my um, passions around the critical race theory piece. So um, when we think about the anniversaries that we just celebrated with the 100 year anniversary of the Greenwood, uh, um, massacre. Uh, the Greenwood is, is sort of a, a perfect picture about of why we need to really be thoughtful about where we're going in this nation as it relates to truth telling. And Allison, you said it powerfully. You said uh, New Testament tells us that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Uh, I had an opportunity to interview one of the descendants uh, of the uh, green of the original persons who lived in Greenwood, uh, Jacqueline Blocker, and she talked about how she, how she and her family she didn't even know about what had happened uh, in Greenwood and how her family was impacted um, uh, at, at, until she was an adult. Um, you know, uh, we have this moment where 
it wasn't just a mob, right? It was, it was uh, the police force in that town uh, deputized the mob. And so you have state sanctioned violence against the people of Black Wall Street, right? That, that's a truth that we need to tell uh, for, for two reasons. One, we need to know uh, what happened to the people there, but we also need to, we need to be reminded of the great things that were built there and the history and the, the legacy of those who built Black Wall Street. Um, and so uh, that's, that's sort of one piece. Um, this idea uh, of thinking about uh, a theological, uh, uh, how we think about policing and towards a, a, a Christian theological uh, perspective, Esau Macaulay actually speaks to this powerfully. He talks about uh, how in Romans 13 verses one through seven, uh, there is an admonition that is often missed. And that is that people should not live in fear and terror by, by the state, right? That the New Testament is calling us to not live as a pastor in Washington, DC, as an African-American man from uh, South Jamaica, Queens, New York, I know that no matter your age, uh, if you, and, and you are not a criminal, but you drive down the street or you leave the home or you let your, your, your young people leave and you have a constant worry about whether or not they're gonna come back home safe. Um, that's one, and, and to be very brief, I, I would offer up one other, Dr. Perez, Adam Perez at Duke University School of Divinity uh, takes another approach to this New Testament concept and looks at Revelation chapter seven, where worship is happening around the throne and, uh, and the, the king is seated on the throne. He says that worship oftentimes in our Christian context can allow us to uh, move past uh, the material things that we're dealing with. So folks will say, because I'm a Christian, I focus on, on the hereafter. He says, but you have to look at what sets up the context for that kind of worship. Um, and it is a recognition that God is working through salvation history, uh, that there is a, there's all nations are gathered because this is a picture of justice and wholeness. Uh, and there's, and they are acknowledging uh, God on the throne. Uh, also what Mary does in the Magnificat when she talks about the material conditions being shifted um, and, or, and that's, that's the source of her praise. So uh, I think that leads to a, um, a hermeneutic of justice uh, and causes us to need to reimagine uh, our policing as well as our overall justice system. Thank you for sketching those um really compelling aspects of a new Christian theology of policing. And when we think about uh, God working in our time for justice to move toward the kingdom, I always think about uh, the human rights movement as such a significant part of the trajectory toward justice. And uh, Nicole Austin Hillary, this is um, your area of expertise we know as, as well as Justin's. Nicole, would you talk to us about some of the standards that a human rights perspective on policing in the U.S. brings to us? Um, maybe they relate to um, a theological idea of each person feeling safe, uh, but would be interested to hear what does human rights have to say about what's happening? There's a great deal that we can look to human rights um, for in terms of providing guidance for how we should respond to this moment. Um, many people in the United States are very familiar with our, our civil rights laws. Um, and when they think about um, issues around injustice, they often think, well, we, we turn to the civil rights laws in order to seek protection, in order to seek guidance as to how we right wrongs. But so too uh, is that true with respect to human rights and in fact, I ask people to think about civil rights and human rights as being inextricably linked because they are. Um, you, in this, in this nation, the issues that we think of when we talk about voting rights, and again, as you've already heard in this conversation, we are at a crossroads when it comes to voting rights. Voting rights are human rights. 
Um, it, it is addressed in human rights treaties. It is addressed in the Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights. And that's what we turn to often um, as our guide um, for the rights that we protect and defend. And there are rights to safety. There are rights to freedom. There are rights to things like clean water and access to clean water, access to, to health, um, access to housing. All of those things are freedom and rights that are discussed um, in the body of human rights laws and treaties. So to me, we should be looking at that as a way to embolden and bolster our arguments for why we need certain protections here in the United States. That should strengthen our resolve and strengthen our arguments. Um, and we should be looking at how to use civil rights and human rights um, collaboratively as we are trying to right so many of these wrongs. And the other thing that I think is so important is, you know, what I started to talk about earlier in the conversation, which is, this is not just a fight in the United States. This is a world fight. And if you are looking at this as a, a moment where there is global focus on how we combat police violence, on how we combat targeted racism, um, you know, targeted at specific communities, if we want to look at how do we decrease disparities around health, around education, around housing, we need as much armor uh, in our arsenal as possible. And we get more uh, arsenal, um, we get to enlarge it by going beyond the traditional civil rights laws and looking to human rights. Um, we right now at Human Rights Watch, as are many other organizations, we are working directly with the United Nations um, to, to ask the United Nations to use all of the power at its disposal to really do more and focus more on what we have to do globally in this moment to address issues around race and issues around discrimination. Uh, and I think the more that we can do that and the more that we have other voices beyond the confines of the United States talking about these issues and saying we need to do more, we demand more, I think that's going to em empower us um, to be more effective in terms of, of what we're doing. And for us, everything that we do at Human Rights Watch, our question is always how, you know, what do we look to in terms of human rights and, and, and looking at work through a human rights lens? How do we strengthen it? Um, how, do we, how do we put more meat on the bones, if you will, um, for the arguments that we're trying to make? Um, and we work closely with our friends and partners in the civil rights community and the larger social justice community that's why we work so closely with the faith community. Um, as you know, Allison, we have a faith-based advocate at Human Rights Watch. None of this work, historically, as we all know, has been done without there being a collective effort from the civil rights community, the human rights community, the faith community. Um, when we look at our civil rights movement in the United States from the 1960s, the people on those front lines were often ministers. They were people of faith. Um, and the work that I have been doing throughout my career on civil and human rights, whether it's been on voting rights, whether it's been on trying to restore the right to vote for the formerly incarcerated, whether it's been working on police reform, it has been a movement that has engaged experts and advocates from all of these different communities, and that's what it's going to take. And we have to recognize that there are benefits and expertise that come from all of these different areas and bringing them together collectively is how we are going to be as empowered as, as possible to really make change. We need all the tools we can get. It, it seems clear. And when we do look at the US situated in a global perspective, we know that um, peer countries do not experience the levels of lethal police force that we do here and that the no. in the, some of those statistics are striking. I also wanted to mention to make the connection for viewers who might not be aware that there was a significant faith movement that um, contributed to establishing protections for human rights at the United Nations. Um, and yet there's still so much potential um, yet to be tapped in order to create the kind of reforms we know are needed. Uh, Justin, will you talk to us about some of the uh, reforms on the table, perhaps the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act? What would it do? Um, why is that a, a reform uh, for us to know about and support? 
the, the there are a number of reforms that are that are being debated right now by um, senators in particular Cory Booker, Tim Scott. I'm mentioning their names in case people want to uh, contact their representatives. And the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is uh, the starting point for those negotiations. That that act includes something for everybody essentially there's there's qualified immunity reform for the protesters who want police accountability there's an uh, increase of uh i think 900 million dollars more money uh, more funds going to law enforcement for training and body cameras for those who are um not on board with the uh police abolition or the police defund movement and, and instead would rather see um police reform take place in a more traditional way uh so so i think that the i saw in the chat there was there were some folks who had worked in maryland on police reform i think there are so many ideas out there um to dis to discuss on the national level and on the local level but there's there is a distinction between ideas that lead to a, a total reimagination of what it means to create public safety in our society ideas that ask for there to be a investment in mental health resources and investment in after school programs and investment in um, communities and a uh, divestment from using guns and police to keep our communities safe and ask ourselves how else can we be uh, in the in the project in the business of keeping ourselves and our our neighbors safe and uh, i i tend to support those those types of initiatives i i think that it's a it's a really interesting moment in in our nation's history when we can start to have these conversations in an honest way and again i i just want to just reinforce to this audience i know we have so many wonderful people in this audience who lead a faith-based faith-driven uh, a life that is committed to creating justice um, in the eyes of the Lord. For folks who are taking that perspective, to be the ability to distinguish between what's really going to make our society better, more just, more fair, more godly, and what people try to when people try to use scare tactics and say that you know unless you're pro law enforcement which means to them you know anti black lives matter protester unless you are anti critical race theory unless you know with, they they create this the real division here is this idea that our neighbors are marxists they're you know uh whatever they may call us these these labels as opposed to dealing in the the business of putting labels on people. I'm really happy that folks here are in the business of actually looking, looking at the issues and looking at the issues one by one, making informed decisions based on what is being put in the into the realm of policy, looking at scholarship. Um, I know uh, Nicole Austin Hillary is a scholar who's done writing on police brutality and human rights, for example, her organization, Human Rights has done human rights work in Tulsa. I know I, I'm just I'm familiar with so much literature out there that could inform these discussions. And I'm just happy that people in the faith-based community are taking that approach of using uh, their own intelligence that God gave them to make these decisions as opposed to uh, following the dog whistles that the politicians are putting out there um, for folks to make non-informed decisions based on simply following a herd. And we saw, in fact, even as we were publicizing this event on social media in response to our, our Facebook event, we saw some of the comments exactly that you just described, Justin, some who would push back and say, well, Christians should be for law and order, so don't you think we should be supporting the police? And it's ironic that uh, Reverend Terrence, you mentioned Romans 13, and I think sometimes those folks who are objecting to police reform, they want to bring 
Romans 13 in, um, they might not know about the global legal framework that also um, gives us some instruction about what it means to, to follow legal principles. Um, but Reverend Terrence, based on your work um, in your church and with other churches through Sojourners, you know, what would you say to U.S. Christians who um, might be on the other side of this conversation about police reform? Do you have a message for those folks? Sure. So if I'm speaking to Christians, I say that particularly when it comes to uh, police reform and qualified immunity, that it's not just a legal issue is a theological issue. That if we believe that all persons are created in the image and likeness of God, that means that every person has, has imprinted upon them, the way I say it to my church is, you've got the divine fingerprint. No, no fingerprint is the same, that you are, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are uh, uniquely designed. Um, if every person is created in that way, then we believe every person um, has dignity and value. And then we also know that the church then has a responsibility to protect these lives. Um, only God can give a life. Uh, but somehow uh, with the policy of qualified immunity, we've allowed it to be the case that you can take a life and um, officers are allowed to uh, uh, shoot first and think later, right? Um, and let's be clear about qualified immunity. Qualified immunity doesn't bring justice. Qualified immunity only brings accountability, right? Justice is, is bringing back Tamir Rice. It is theologically, it is the reversal of what was done wrong, right? Um, justice is bringing back George Floyd. Um, have we, have we, where, where have we been in the last year? Well, Derek, Derek Chauvin was convicted, but he hasn't been sentenced. Like, that, that's not justice. We're just fighting, Black people are, and, and our nation is fighting for, for uh, accountability. Um, I had an opportunity to interview uh, uh, civil rights attorney, Benjamin Crump, and he often talks about how, uh, when he thinks about this sort of act, people of color being shot in the back, in fact, is, as an epidemic, um, he, he asked the question, you know, why is that such a threat that someone running away from an officer um, is such a threat that, that they are often shot in the back? Um, and he, he often talks, he talks about uh, how throughout history, there are things that were legal, but they were not right, right? Bri Breonna Taylor being shot in her home sleeping, right? That, that was legal, but there's something deeply, grossly unjust about that. Um, and, and um, you know, as, as people of faith, uh, we've, we've got to recognize that uh, as the body of Christ, when one, when one part suffers, the entire part body suffers. Now, let me be very clear. As a pastor, I'm not anti-police. Lord knows. I mean, we've got, I'm grateful for, uh, for officers who sit in my pew, uh, we are not anti-police. In fact, I think police officers that are police officers of color worry about their own children as well. But we do have um, a systemic issue that is going to require um, is going to require uh, uh, reimagine reimagining and transformation. Um, and thank God for the young people who have led this movement. But I also think that there is an opportunity for a theological voice. I think there's an opportunity for a more robust engagement from the church. And we, we indeed have work to do in order uh, uh, to bring uh, justice on this issue. And one more question uh, to Nicole before we bring in some audience questions. Um, when you think about your work in the human rights movement as a, a human rights professional, what role do you see for faith communities there? Why was it important at Human Rights Watch to connect the vital work you're doing with uh, faith communities in this country? Well, Allison, you know, as, as I alluded to earlier, throughout history, in the United States, the faith community has been on the front lines for every major fight 
and movement for human and civil rights and social justice in this country. This work cannot be done without these voices um, being engaged. Um, and for us at Human Rights Watch, we know that so many of the voices that can often reach communities that we can't, or that can speak to communities in ways that we can't, it is vital to have their voices and their leadership around the table. That's what makes for successful movements. Movements are not monolithic, nor are the people who make up the movements monolithic. Um, we can't, as a community, profess equity and um, freedom for all if we are not having all of those voices represented at the table as we push for protections and as we push for human and civil rights. So it is key to have those voices there. And it is key to have those individuals who can impact communities in ways that we just can't um, on the front line with us. And I'll, I'll give you a quick example. You know, we have been doing a human rights watch in our US program work in Tulsa for the last four years. Um, in fact, what's, what brought us to Tulsa was the murder of Terrence Crutcher by a white police officer. And um, as people may recall, that white police officer, she was tried, she was not convicted. And the Crutcher Family created the, the, the Crutcher Family Foundation. And we went there because we said, what is going on in Tulsa? What is going on with policing? Why are there problems here in this community such that a Terrence Crutcher ends up dead at the hands of a police officer? Well, when we went to the ground, got, got on the ground and started working with the community, some of the very first people that we began working with and that we still work with are the faith leaders, um, are the leaders of the different churches. Um, you know, the leader uh, of, of Vernon AME, which was, which was one of the only buildings um, that was not completely destroyed during the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. Um, those voices being with us and us supporting those voices has made a huge difference in terms of us being able to connect with the community. And I tell people all the time, we might be lawyers and advocates and researchers, but it's not our voices that are the most important. It's the voices of the community. And we know that having faith leaders and faith organizations working with us is going to allow us to do as much as we can and to connect in ways that we might otherwise not be able to if we are working hand in hand um, with faith leaders and with the faith community. This work just cannot be done and the justice that we are all seeking cannot be achieved if we are not all around this table together. I like to say we are, we are all collectively a group of justice warriors. And that's what it takes. It's going to take this group of justice warriors that's going to have to include the faith leaders as well as the lawyers and the advocates and the abolitionists and everybody. We all have to have a place at the table. Mm -hmm. Amazing, inspiring to think about us being justice warriors and being part of this broad movement that you've explained really takes all kinds of communities, faith communities included. I know we have a lot of folks in the in the audience who may have questions. I see some questions in the Q and A box. Um, I want to invite my colleague Charlie, our program officer here at Justice Revival, to uh, come on if he would and pose the first audience question to to our panelists. Oh, hi, panelists. Uh, thank you for joining us. I have some uh, questions from the audience here. Uh, first, uh, we have, how do you think that predictive policing algorithms have played into racial profiling and how do we address, counteract uh, their influence? Um, I'm going to jump in there, Allison. Um, I'm sure Justin probably has some things to add to that as well, um, based on his academic work. But at Human Rights Watch, we have been addressing this issue of predictive policing and the use of algorithms um, for a long time. And can you just tell us, for those of us not in the know, what does it mean when we say predictive policing algorithm? Yes, it's, it's when we use uh, technology to help us basically determine the probability of an individual's, um, the probability that they 
may re-engage with the criminal justice system, how likely they are to commit a crime or if they are, for instance, um, let out on bail. Um, sometimes algorithms are used to say, you know, do we think this person is more likely to return if we give them bail to court or will they be a person more likely to recommit a crime? Um, and so the science is supposed to theoretically help the criminal justice system do its work more effectively. And it's also argued that it can help to provide more opportunities to individuals um, because it gives us options. But what we have found, like with so much science, um, that sometimes it can have um, you know, inadvertent consequences. Um, and that what we're finding is that particular policing has been used in a way that has a disparate impact on persons of color, on poor communities, and that it is not as objective uh, as the creators of these algorithms would lead us to believe. Um, and so we, we question that, we question its use uh, and we question how it is impacting certain communities versus others. And at Human Rights Watch, not only is our US program working on this issue from a criminal justice perspective, but we also have data and technology experts in other divisions of Human Rights Watch who are looking at it um, from that perspective too. And that's the division of our organization that not only works on those issues, but looks at issues around um, surveillance um, and who is surveyed and how is surveillance science used as well. Um, and all of those technologies, while, on, while facially may sound like they could be used for good, often um, you know, are, can be manipulated and again, our, we have found are being used in ways that continue to have a disparate impact on black, brown, and poor communities. So when we talk about systemic racism, it runs this deep that new tools being developed today reflect those patterns, have that disparate impact disproportionately affecting black and brown communities, astounding as an example of, of what we mean when we speak of systemic racism. Um, Charlie, is there another audience question you want to pose to our, our experts? Yes, sure. Uh, another question is, what is the uh, best method or route we can use to make our voices heard uh, in this advocacy? And how do we overcome the political blockades that seem to be in place? Justin, do you want to take this on? You talked earlier about some of the cross currents that we're seeing in terms of local developments, some being positive, others being more retrogressive. How can people make their voices heard? I'll say this. I think that this community, the faith-based community, is one of the more important communities in terms of political um, change because Right now, and uh, after I'm going to be a bit partisan on this, but you know it is it is um, it is advertised that the faith community is um, you know primarily the, the property of the Republican Party, and that's not true. And I, I but there are people in the faith community who are um, in some sense conflating the Republican Party with the Christian faith, and all of that, you know, that is something that is, you know, it's not just based on um, what the pastor mentioned in terms of people arguing that there are biblical reasons to support law and order in an uncritical way. I know there are a number of other issues that people have used to, to draw a fine line uh, uh, from a partisan perspective, arguing that you, you know, you're not uh, in some way, shape, or form, living up to your faith unless you vote for a particular party. And uh, I think that that what that means is that in your churches, in your communities, in your um, congregation, congregations, um, having these discussions with people who know you and know your heart and know that you are genuine and that you're not here to uh, brainwash them or, you know, anything like that, uh, you can really talk to people who will never uh, listen to a professor or a lawyer or a critical race theory scholar, but they'll listen to their fellow congregant because, you know, they they hear your voice, but they won't hear my voice. So they, they so their 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 voice, the voice of this community, is in in those spaces 
more powerful. And when we are such, and we are on such a, uh, we're such a nation, a nation that's divided to such to such a degree. Fifty senators Republican, fifty senators Democrat, like right down the middle. So the your voice can really tiff, uh, tilt the balance. It doesn't take much to tilt the balance, and 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 uh, you are you have access to the people who will actually tilt that balance. I have to admit, oftentimes I feel like I preach to the congregation of you know critical race theorists, and we're talking to each other, and uh, other people um, on the other side of the political partisan divide would never in a million million years listen to anything I have to say. But I, I hope that we can start the conversation. And I hope that you can start this conversation in the audience so that people will actually start to uh, be able to exchange ideas with each other. That, that moves me to want to just share, if I can, on a personal note, as a white gal who hails from the Dallas, Texas area and the North Florida area where my friend Ben Crump and I met in college, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Convention in an all white um, Baptist church where I learned about Jesus, but I, I didn't learn about God's heart for justice. And I'm grateful that that came later. And so seeing the division within our Christian community in this country on vital issues of justice, like racialized policing, I just, I want to ask my friends to come to Jesus on this and see the pain and suffering that uh, communities of color have endured for far too long and just consider what the gospel asks of us when we're uh, talking about doing the work of justice and human rights and valuing the lives of our neighbors. And I know that's a message that you, Reverend Terrence, have been active in mobilizing through the work that you do at Sojourners. Maybe you could tell us about what Sojourners is doing, engaging people of faith, and how perhaps some of our audience members could be a part of that. Absolutely. So again, we are committed to uh, theology and racialized policing. And um, again, just to refer back to Esau, Esau McCauley's work, which I think is, is really powerful, just this idea of um, coming to, and, and Adam Perez, recognizing that how we think about these systems, uh, how we think about how our brothers and sisters in faith uh, should not have to experience terror uh, by the state. Um, we lean into this work through our theology and racialized policing work, how, how we can create the conditions for humanity to acknowledge a God who is sovereign that is above the state and to do that on one accord, despite um, our race, our class, our differences. And so uh, we have, um, uh, piloted a program here in the Washington DC area uh, in 2020 uh, with 50 pastors uh, in partnership with Howard University School of Divinity. Over the course of about nine months, we all walked through uh, this, I, this, um, the, this rich, res rich resources around uh, these, these issues of theology and racialized policing. Uh, we then went down to uh, Duke University School of Divinity and uh, worked with scholars there on this issue uh, in a black brown way to also look at issues around uh, immigration and how there are intersections uh, between the two. We are so excited that uh, we had our first local uh, group that we brought together a year ago, but we are preparing for this summer on July 8th we will launch our first national cohort uh, in partnership with Howard University School of Divinity on theology and racialized policing. And we've targeted 15 states around the country uh, for recruitment, uh, states where there have been high profile incidences of police violence. Um, and we're looking to recruit leaders that have had to wrestle in their own city and states with uh, many of the stories that are part of our uh, our, our recent memory. And so uh, we would love for pastors and next generation faith leaders is what we're calling it. We're having intergenerational mentoring between senior level leaders, as well as seminarians and uh, persons who are postdoc, uh, postdoc 
or just persons who are rising in ministry. And you can find out more about that work on our website on sojo.net. Amazing. Great to know about that. So faith leaders who want to go deeper in your mobilization on these issues, uh, definitely check out that theology and policing cohort at Sojourners. And we just have a couple minutes left. So I'd like to give each of our panelists a chance to share one brief concluding word. Um, Nicole, will you start us off with, with your conclusion here? Yes, and, and I looked at all of the questions. They're amazing questions. I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to, to get to all of them. But one of the things that I wanna leave with everyone is this. I think this is a, an opportunity in this moment for us to push the envelope on things that are just hard for this country to swallow. Talking about race, talking about critical race theory, talking about slavery and the history of this country that is what is going to get us, as I know so many of us um, who are faith believers, that's what's going to get us to the other side. You have to go through it. You can't go around it. You can't ignore it. You have to go through it. And this is a journey that we as a nation and as a community, a world community have to go through. Um, we have to face up to this history. Part of that is dealing with reparative justice because it's not only being authentic and identifying and claiming and calling out the ills and the evils, but it's also about being bold and saying, okay, what are we going to do about it? So we have to push this country to not only face up to the history, but also face up to what it's going to take to do something about it. We at Human Rights Watch, um, as well as many, of the group, faith groups are walking the reparations walk because we think that has to be a vital part of how this country tries to not make amends because you can't make amends, but how this country can start to begin to heal uh, and to try to make communities as whole as possible despite the history of degradation and discrimination and pillaging we want people to go to their leaders, to go to local leaders, to go to national leaders and say, we demand that you have this discussion. We are pushing right now to move a bill in Congress, House Resolution 40, that simply asks for the creation of a commission to study the issue of reparations and the history of slavery in the United States. We can't allow our leaders to be fearful to again, going back to where we started, to have these conversations. They can't fear having these conversations. They can't fear looking in the mirror and addressing what has happened in this country and what that has meant for communities and how it's still impacting communities to this day. So I would urge everyone to be bold and demand that we do the hard work and that we push our leaders to do the hard work. One of the things that I've said about Juneteenth, and I'll end here, Allison, I think it's wonderful that we have a Juneteenth holiday, but do not allow our leaders to behave as though giving us a federal holiday is the end of it. That's just a springboard. There has to be something behind that. And what has to be behind that is doing real work around reparation and the whole bevy of reparative justice that it's going to take to bring about freedom and equity in this country. Mm. A resounding call to be bold in seeking transformation, not just small incremental reforms, not just holidays, big change. Justin Hansford, your, your brief concluding word for us. Yeah, I, I don't really wanna follow that. I think Nicole um, really articulately explained the situation and our next steps. I put a link to our website in the chat uh, for anyone who's interested in the work we're doing at the Thurgood Marshall Center, we focus on police violence and reparations and uh, a few other issues as well. And I think that um, it's as, I, again, I can't say it better than Nicole said it. I think that moving forward, we have to work together. We have to reach more communities. It's, it's clear that as much as we've made progress over the, the previous year, 
We are not at the place uh, politically as a community, as a nation, to overwhelmingly, resoundingly get the reforms we need to create a more just uh, society. I'm happy to learn about the things happening with uh, Pastor McKinley's work with Sojourners. And I know, Allison, you're doing great work. And we're going to find ways to work together um, in the future. I know we are. And, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm hoping that anyone here in the audience who wants to collaborate will also reach out to us and uh, be eager to do so. I'm, I'm definitely eager to work together. And Terrence, your concluding word for us. Sure, so I'm gonna yield my concluding word to uh, Gayrod S. Wilmore, who is a theologian and ethicist who went home to be with the Lord in 2020, who said that embedded within the black religious tradition are the tools and resources for survival, elevation, and liberation. And I would even say beyond the black religious tradition, but in our faith, for him, survival was just the sheer ability to hold yourself together, that faith holds us together, right? That uh, elevation uh, in, in the black religious tradition was, uh, it was the faith was always a ladder out of whatever you've been in uh, and liberation that you cannot understand the New Testament without understanding a liberating Jesus. Uh, when I think about racialized policing, when I think about justice reform uh, and what we need to do to address the system, when I think about over 360 laws that have been implemented in states to keep persons of color from the ballot box, when I think about how there is an overarching erasure of our history uh, and an effort to uh, keep us from knowing uh, about the pain of our past, and which could lead to repeating those mistakes. Uh, I know that we need people of faith to be energized, um, to recognize that we have a part to play um, and for us to hold on to our, that liberating, powerful, powerful faith. Very last thing, uh, every pastor has to say, I'm gonna close at least twice. Um, <laughs> the last thing I wanna say, uh, there's a powerful moment that always comes to mind for me Valerie Kaur was at a uh, watch night service here in Washington, DC. And she asked the question, she's an attorney, she asked the question, what if the darkness we see is the darkness of the womb and not the darkness of the tomb? In other words, that we might be able to give birth to something greater than what we're in right now. As a pastor, I'm a prisoner of hope. And she asked, she asked ourselves a question, what will a, a mother uh, who's about to give birth to a baby will tell you what to do in a dark and difficult time. Uh, the, the mother will tell you that they had to do when they were about to give birth, they had to breathe and push. And I want to suggest to people of faith that as we're continuing to advocate and not let this moment pass where we're calling for racial justice, we have to push that in our meetings, in our panels, push in our sermons, push. And in between that breathe, because we are faith rooted, that we have to do this with the help of the power and the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we have to continue to breathe and to push so that we might see a reality that we believe that we can give birth to. That's, that's my hope. That's my hope for everyone. Thank you. So inspiring, all of our guests. We've been talking about truth, justice, liberation, reparations. Uh, thinking about that banquet table in Revelations and knowing that the work of justice in the world is needed to get us to that great day. Thanks for everyone who's joined us, um, especially to our esteemed guest speakers, Nicole Austin Hillary of Human Rights Watch, uh, Terrence McKinley of Sojourners and the African Methodist Episcopal Tradition, Justice, Justin Hansford, uh, rather, of the Thurgood Marshall Center at Howard University School of Law. We have been uh, fortunate and blessed to hear from you all today. Um, thank you again, and uh, let us do continue to, to stay united in the work of justice. You're welcome, Allison. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you all.